All right, it's 12 o'clock. Hi to everyone at home. I'm Lily from the museum's digital engagement team, and I'm so excited to be presenting the fourth day of virtual bouquets to art programming. Thus far, we've learned bouquet basics from florist Philippa Craddock, heard about the history of BTA from docent Maureen Murray Fox, and learned about how our conservators protect our collection throughout the week from conservator Tricia O'Regan. As we've learned, BTA has been a museum tradition for 36 years. Over the course of its run, exhibitors have gravitated towards many pieces in our permanent collection and beyond. So today we're lucky to be joined by Karen Brewer, curator in charge of the Achenbach Foundation of Graphic Arts, who serves as, as our curator liaison to our exhibitors during BTA. Karen will be diving into their top five choices, showing us a few bouquets from each. Please ask Karen a question in the comment section and we'll get to it at the end of the session. Karen, thank you so much for joining us. Tricia, thank you for that very nice introduction. It's been my pleasure over the past 25 years to have served as the curatorial liaison to Bouquets to Art, and especially to have worked with Lisa Harris, chair of the Exhibitors Committee and her predecessor, Barbara Harbinson, on selecting the works of art that are showcased in BTA. Lisa has the unenviable task of matching floral designers with selected works of art, a strategic feat that is critical to the success of the event. She knows which designer is best paired with a particular work of art and the success of the annual displays is a testimony to her wisdom and strategic thinking. After all these many years that the event has been at the De Young, I never knew what artworks were the most requested favorite inspirations for our BTA floral designers. So it was a bit of a surprise when I received a top five list that must have originated from Lisa. So in no particular order, here are the top five. Most museum visitors are familiar with the 15 wire sculptures by Ruth Asawa that are installed in the tower lobby. Positions that highlight the sculpture are among the most coveted by BTA exhibitors. Asawa was born in 1926. A Japanese American, she graduated from high school inside the wire fences of a Japanese internment camp in 1943. Freed from the camp by the government only for educational purposes, Asawa made her way to Black Mountain College, an experimental school near Asheville, North Carolina. During a school field trip to Mexico, Asawa learned a wire crocheting technique that would become the heart of her practice. Large scale sculptures suspended from the ceiling and made of crocheted wire mesh. These abstract wire sculptures are sometimes reminiscent of dividing cells. Others directly reference plants and flowers such as cacti, succulents, and hydrangea. Her works are art historically categorized as biomorphic because they evoke living forms. Asawa, a longtime San Francisco resident, had a close association with the fine arts museums. She was a trustee of the museum from 1989 to 1997 and made lasting contributions to the evolution of the new de Young. For example, she advised Herzog and de Miron on the design of the de Young Tower and provided hours of public testimony in support of the building's innovative architecture. In anticipation of the new de Young, Asawa was invited by the museum's director at the time, Harry Parker, to create a permanent installation for the tower lobby. She selected and donated 15 of her most significant sculptures, including several of her internationally acclaimed wire sculptures from the 1950s and 1960s, which have been prominently displayed ever since the building opened in 2005. 
The tower lobby space with its gray concrete walls and dramatic spotlighting is perhaps one reason why BTA exhibitors select positions there. Colorful flowers really stand out. But it appears that Asawa's sculptures are the main reason. Designers can and do construct arrangements using plant materials that resemble and evoke Asawa's forms. On the left, for example, in this multi-tiered arrangement, the top tier has purple allium emerging from a cloud of baby's breath. And the middle and bottom tier arrangements utilize chive blossoms and succulents. This designer used dried floral materials to draw the viewer's eye from top to bottom, mimicking the connected globular forms in Asawa's sculptures. The designer of the piece on the right utilized a minimal amount of floral material and instead replicated the woven structure of a Sawa sculpture by covering chicken wire fencing material with dried bleached leaves and inserting succulents into the structure's openings. Here are another couple of pieces that were inspired by Asawa's work. In the exhibit on the left, the designer used an entire tree, branches, trunk, and roots in this floral homage to Asawa. Black netting covered the branches, creating a cloud-like effect, and the root structure was covered in pink blossoms that resemble raindrops, or at least that's one per personal per possible interpretation of this rather surreal display. Because of straight space restric restrictions and to avoid damaging works of art, in certain locations, we ask exhibitors for a small, low arrangement. That was likely the case with the exhibitor on the right, who rose to the challenge with a horizontal rather than a vertical floral piece. It's difficult to tell what plant form Asawa might have been referring to in her sculpture, or if it references a plant form at all, as the elements resemble open basket shapes. The floral designer chose to show the open basket forms brimming with fabric flowers, as well as red anthurium and green hydrangea blossoms. Frank Stella's large painting, Letter on the Blind, Lettre sur les aveugles, painted in 1974, takes up an entire wall in Gallery 14. It was acquired in 2013 and immediately became a favorite of BTA exhibitors. Stella was 23 years old when he burst onto the New York art scene as a fully formed artist with his now legendary black paintings. Devoid of illusionistic space or pictorial illusions, these works boldly demonstrated Stella's assertion that a painting was a flat surface with paint on it, nothing more. In the black paintings, Stella also developed the foundations for what would become his signature stripes, which are seen in the painting Letter on the Blind. The almost standardized widths of these bands or stripes is based on the width of the two and three quarter inch brush that Stella used to create the paintings and continue to use in subsequent works. Letter on the Blind is one of the largest works from Stella's aptly named Concentric Square series, which he began in 1962. The scale of this work transforms it from a mere painting into an enveloping and experiential color field. The work's title, Letter on the Blind, refers to a famous essay by the 18th century French philosopher Denis Diderot. The essay was prompted in part by medical advancements that enabled doctors to restore vision to some patients who had been blind since birth. These operations inspired great speculation on the nature of vision, a subject that aligned with Stella's conceptual and perceptual interests three centuries later. The colorful concentric squares in the painting almost always inspire floral designers who are selected for this coveted position. In the piece on the left, three bouquets feature mostly tropical flower varieties. 
heliconia, anthurium, orchids, and leaves that directly respond to Stella's bright color palette. And the designer has added rigid black and white frames as a reference to the monochromatic squares that separate Stella's colorful squares, seeking perhaps to visually contain the loose arrangement of colorful flowers. On the right is a single design from another BTA year in which colored plexi sheets are arranged by size in much the same order as Stella's concentric squares. Flowers are inserted between the sheets in a very loose arrangement of orchids and leaves that bring wild disorder to the controlled geometry of the colored plexi. In these two views of the same arrangement, we can see how a designer succumbed to the lure of Stella's rigid geometry in a very large framed piece that encapsulates the petals only of flowers arranged in the same order as Stella's concentric squares. This exhibit can be viewed from both sides, but in the frontal view, one can see Stella's painting through the glass and it's obvious that Stella's bands of color are the immediate reference. Cornelia Parker's Anti-Mass from 2005 is a sculpture that is installed in the back portion of Gallery 16. It's constructed from the charred remains of a Southern Baptist church with a predominantly African-American congregation, which was destroyed by arsonists. After Parker learned of the arson, she received permission to use the timbers of the burned church to make this piece. The sculpture consists of approximately 800 pieces of charred wood, many with protruding nails, that hang from approximately 138 lines attached to a ceiling grid. Throughout her career, Cornelia Parker's work explores the transformation of seemingly durable materials by violent means, such as bombing, lightning, or fire. Once the materials have undergone drastic changes, Parker directs the viewer to meanings conveyed by these found objects in both their altered and unaltered states. In Anti-Mass, Parker captures the spirit of those who previously worshiped in the building until the fire turned it into a testament to violence directed against African-Americans. Her work hovers as a miraculous spectral object evoking both the lost church and the presence of its congregation through an absence more powerful than any figurative image. Floral interpretations of this hanging sculpture are always interesting and sometimes, as in the case of this quite literal floral design, in which Parker's hanging structure is replicated on a small scale. But instead of charred wood, dark black leaves are suspended from wires. And the arson fire that caused the building's destruction is referenced by bright red and orange bromeliads whose sharp triangular bracts resemble flames. On the left, an interpretation of Parker's piece goes beyond the literal. It is incredibly powerful in its evocation of the triumph of faith and hope, symbolized by white calla lilies that reach up in triumph over adversity. Also in this floral design, the arson fire is represented by a dark black container with cutouts resembling flames. You have to look really carefully to find those cutouts. It's one of the BTA exhibits that must be considered container and all in its entirety to be best understood. The interpretation on the right poses more questions than answers and is an it as a good example of the kind of arrangement that gives BTA viewers pause. There is no direct literal reference to the charred wood of the sculpture. And because we can't see the stems of the red and black anthuriums, only their heart-shaped flowers, we might speculate that they symbolize the fire that's, that uh, destroyed the church. But in fact, I think the floral designer might have done some reading about Cornelia Parker's Catholic heritage and her fascination with the ceremony of the Roman Catholic mass and its ritual of transubstantiation. 
in which round wafers and wine are converted into the body and blood of Christ during the Eucharist. The red anthurium might very well symbolize Christ's blood and the white orb at the top might be a stand-in for the round white bread wafer that becomes the body of Christ. The pyramidal arrangement that culminates at the top with the white orb might also suggest the priest actions of holding up the host and chalice in front of the congregants. The museum's acquired Rhapsody by Richard Mayhew in 2010. Mayhew, an artist and arts educator, is now 96 years old and lives and works in Aptos and Santa Cruz, California. For more than 35 years, he has painted landscapes that verge on the abstract, but always retain elements that recall natural forms. Mayhew's paintings are derived from an intimacy and absorption with nature and man's relationship to it, achieving mystery and beauty in combinations of color that are as surprising as they are evocative. It has been suggested that his abstract, brightly colored landscapes are informed by his experiences as an African-American, Native American, as well as his interest in jazz and the performing arts. With its vibrant color scheme of orange, deep purple, blue, and green, and its composition of simple abstract shapes, Rhapsody is a magnet for BTA exhibitors. In it, a cluster of trees emerge from a ridge of green grass and is silhouetted as a purple shape against a bright orange sky. Another group of trees is silhouetted in the background. We can barely make out the trunks of the tree cluster and our eye is drawn instead to its uppermost branches and foliage. Here's Mayhew himself standing next to his painting and a bouquet that has been inspired by it. It struck me that the shape of the bouquet seems to mimic the shape of the tree crown and it's filled with blooms in all the colors of Mayhew's painting purple orchids, purple allium, and orange pincushion protea. Green succulents are nestled within clumps of cushion moss, as are yellow crespedia. They're also known as billy balls or billy buttons, and we see them often in BTA displays. In this next slide on the left is an arrangement from another BTA year that shows a similar engagement with the shape of Mayhew's trees. And again, tiny yellow flowers punctuate the green base, encouraging one to look closer at the painting to see that there are patches of yellow orange in the grass, perhaps not noticed at first glance. This arrangement utilizes some of the same floral elements, pincushions, succulents, and moss as the previously seen arrangement, but there is a more concentrated use of deep purple orchids and blue hydrangea to mimic the dark blue outlines of the trees in the background. In this photograph, we get a sense, a real sense, I think, of the colors in the painting, particularly the purple and the bright fuchsia, and can understand better why they are so often emphasized in the floral interpretations of Rhapsody. On the left, the floral design is composed almost entirely of orchids in shades of orange and at least two shades of purple. And in, in a unique take, the floral designer has added stems that resemble tree trunks, a reminder that this is a floral interpretation of tree forms. BTA floral designers are given the option of providing their own pedestals rather than using our standard white painted ones. In the interpretation on the right, the pedestal is festooned with dark green moss, mimicking the forest floor from which green ferns emerge, and then layers of colors that appear in the painting. There is a cutout placed at the top that recalls the curves and openings of the treetops. Here we see Robert Henry's Lady in Black with a Spanish scarf from 1910. The woman depicted in this painting is Henry's wife, Marjorie Organ, whom he affectionately referred to as O. 
Ergen was a cartoonist for the New York Journal and also an active member of the dress reform movement, a group with feminist and health concerns that rejected fashions containing restrictive whalebone corsets and bustles. In the painting, Henry used vigorous fluid brushstrokes to present his wife as a strong liberated woman clothed in loose modern attire who gazes directly and confidently at the viewer. Henry studied in the late 1880s at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts with Thomas Pollock Anschutz, under whose influence he developed a brushy realist style. He later became a leading figure of the Ashcan School of Painting, popular at the turn of the century, which was characterized by subjects drawn from urban life. It always surprises and delights me when floral artists select a piece that must be challenging color palette wise. In the interpretation on the left, a mannequin shaped form has been created out of curly willow. While the bodice is entirely covered in red roses and red is definitely not a color seen very much in the painting, the subject hair is, is recalled in a cap of orchids and her shawl is a bevy of delicate white flowers that resemble the lace of a Spanish shawl depicted in the painting. The design on the right is a decidedly contemporary take on Henry's painting in which a black, in which, sorry, in which black or dark red leaves attached to a form at the bottom mid waist and neckline serve as suggestions of O's black dress. Her hair is implied with a mass of rust colored lilies and her shawl is a drape of white calla lilies. Sorry about the background noise. That's, that's my husband in the kitchen. Eek. Okay. Three different uh, interpretations of Henry's painting of O are presented here in three displays from the last three years of BTA, 2017, 2018, and 2019. Two are remarkable because of the designer's use of vase forms that suggest O's black dress. On the far left, the black vase form is decorated in one area near the top with tiny orange red rosebuds to, to suggest the jeweled brooch that O wears. A combination of orange red roses and orange pincushion flowers represent the varied colors of her hair. O's shawl is composed of small white roses and stringy dried Spanish moss, appropriate perhaps for its suggestion of the lace in the Spanish shawl that O wears. In the center slide, an unusually tall black vase form has its focus on the strongest of the painting's elements. O's shawl and her hair, but the addition of a fan of tall calla lily stems and crooked willow at the top of the arrangement makes me wonder if the floral designer was imagining an aura or halo emanating from O's figure. On the far right slide, although the floral designer has also chosen a black vase, it doesn't necessarily refer to O's dress. Instead, the vase holds an assortment of blooms that refer to all the colors in the painting. Dark red leaves, orange lilies and roses, orange orchids and tulips, kangaroo paws, and pink ginger flowers, and an assortment of white and other pink blossoms. It is incredibly satisfying to view this complex and varied bouquet arrangement next to the painting. The BTA team has been kind enough to oblige me in providing some slides of bouquets that highlight artworks in temporary exhibitions and installations. I'm always thrilled when the bouquets chairs select an image from the works on the, sorry, from the works on paper collection at the museum as the signature image for the event and was delighted with the selection of Andy Warhol's flowers, a color lithograph from 1964. It was BTA's signature image in 2018 and was installed in Hellman Hallway for the event. Warhol's bright orange and pink flowers set against a green grass background led one floral designer 
to think of a picnic. At least that's what I think the basket shaped container on the left implies. It's filled with flowers in the same hue of orange as Warhol's. A very different interpretation was positioned nearby. In this rather sculptural piece, Warhol's green grass leaves are magnified in a kind of wild green construction and rainbow tinted roses are probably a nod to Warhol's brand of pop art. The modern and contemporary print displays in Gallery 17 rotate frequently and every year BTA exhibitors are able to select from new works on view. In this slide we can see three exuberant displays that were inspired by works in a Frank Stella print exhibition held in 2017. All three designers tackled the structural forms in Stella's prints, recreating the intricate webbing in one and the protractor-like protector curves in another. The designer who chose the star form did something interesting, I think, and took all the colors of Stella's print and replicated them with a loose display of flowers, leaving the star shape as a cutout form only. All three of these floral displays made me look at the prints more closely to identify elements in them that I'd never noticed before. Often during BTA week, there is no exhibition on view at the De Young in the Herbst Special Exhibition Galleries. Recently though, BTA designers have been encouraged to create displays that reference shows that are soon to open. Prior to our presentation of the Summer of Love experience in summer 2017, one designer created a marvelous homage to the summer of 1967 with a psychedelic poster emerging from a patch of green grass speckled with daisies. And that same year, a designer with a position in Wilsey Court created the most amazing display of a giant pipe spewing out cascades of yellow orchids that represented flower power, a slogan of the summer of love. Although flower power referred to the passive resistance of the anti-war movement, it could also be applied to the power of flowers to move us every year at Bouquets to Art. Thanks for joining me to view some of past standout floral displays paired with the most popular frequently requested artworks. I look forward to seeing you next year at hopefully an in-person BTA week. Thank you so much, Karen. That was so wonderful, so beautiful. I feel like, you know, it's sad that we aren't in the museum right now. A couple of people have commented that they wish they were there, but being able to see, you know, variations on one piece where typically you only see one, I think is really great. So we have a few questions for you. Um, a good one to start out with is, I'd love to hear about the Legion of Honor years. How was the process of selecting artwork in that museum versus the de Young? Well, I actually started out as the liaison when the when BTA was featured, uh, I think every other year at the Legion. And my first couple of stints with, with BTA um, were uh, at the Legion. Um, it was a much different process in those days because of course, you know, we had, we, um, we all didn't have personal computers and things were done via telephone and maybe fax machines. So the whole uh, sort of network of florists was, was uh, connected um, uh, very closely with Barbara Harbinson, who was then the, uh, the coordinator. Um, and, and from the curatorial side, I know that things weren't quite as smoothly run as, as they are today. Um, for example, I remember uh, that on selection day, a young first time florist to BTA selected a work in gallery 19. And when she appeared with all of her flowers on installation day, another painting was in the place of the one that she'd selected. She was 
heartbroken. She was crestfallen. She'd spent hundreds of dollars on this one um, arrangement, her first arrangement, a debut arrangement for BTA. Um, but it turned out that her, her fellow floral designers came to her aid. And when they saw that she lacked flowers that complemented the colors in the painting, they donated their own flowers so that she could have something that actually looked as if it was inspired by that painting. It, um, it's memorable to me, and I have to say, in the history of BTA, it's, um, it's one of the most beautiful arrangements um, that I, I think I can recall. Oh, that's so nice. Um, all right, does Karen have a garden at home? And if so, what do you grow? Oh gosh, I do have a garden at home and I love to garden. It's my escape from the world of, of art and art history and museum life. Um, I live on a hillside in Marin and it is dotted with a lot of oak trees. Um, which means that I have to be limited in what I landscape with. And so I have a shade garden with uh, azaleas, camellias, hydrangeas, rhododendron, um, and my favorite Japanese maples. All right, a follow-up question to that is, have you ever made a BTA style bouquet? I have not, but I've decided that when I retire, one of the first things I wanna do is um, take a class in Ikebana because I think the Ikebana displays are some of my favorites at BTA. Um, I am, am in awe of the way they construct uh, their arrangements um, and the importance of the container in their arrangements. And so um, I think, uh, that's an inspiration to me that I've never tried at home. Um, I think I need some training before I do that. I'm sure your husband wouldn't mind practice. <laughs> um, okay, I think I see one more question. Um, what gallery is your favorite during BTA? Oh gosh. It's, um, it's hard to pick an absolute favorite because it changes from year to year, depending on what's on display. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, Gallery 17, which is the works on paper gallery, changes every year. So the, the works of art are always new and different for the floral designers. And I'm, I'm always inspired by what I see in that gallery. Um, but some of my favorite artworks are, for example, the Richard Diebenkorn Ocean Park painting. I love pretty much any floral display that is put in front of that piece. And then my, um, another favorite of mine is the El Anatsui piece um, that is typically in gallery 16. And um, that, that evokes some very creative and sculptural displays in BTA. But, but I have to say um, that the, the um, Arrangements at BTA that I love the most are the actual bouquets. As much as I admire the very avant-garde, sometimes sculptural creations that our, our BTA um, designers create, I love nothing more than a simple bouquet that with the flowers chosen is evocative or inspired by the colors in the painting. That makes sense. I enjoy those too. We have a question about the piece of artwork behind you. Um, and is that it works well with the bouquet in front of it. <laughs> oh, it's very cute. Um, uh, well, my, my office is my dining room, <laughs> as it is for many of you. And so um, the painting behind me was done by my husband uh, probably 35 years ago. Um, when he had the time and inclination to be making art and uh, the anthurium that's in front of it is thankfully still alive for this event. It, it thrives on nothing but neglect. Um, and <laughs> lucky for me that they are pretty hardy plants. <laughs> that's funny. All right, I lied. There are a couple more questions coming in now. Um, 
a quick one. Um, did you major in art in college? I did, yes. Uh, no, I, I didn't uh, major in fine arts. Uh, I majored in art history in college and in graduate school. And interestingly enough, I was thinking about this the other day, the path not taken. Um, when I was applying for graduate school, <clears throat> I uh, was interested in not going straight into art history, but veering off into something that could utilize my undergraduate art history training. And um, I actually investigated going to the School of Landscape Architecture at UC Berkeley. Um, and I often wonder uh, what would have happened if I decided to do that and go in that direction. Somehow that's fed, uh, that, that long ago desire or interest is fed, I think, by my, uh, my interest in my own garden, but also being the liaison to bouquets to art. All right, um, I found a good one to end on. Um, and this ties us back to um, our conservation talk that we already had. What's the most surprising material that you've seen brought to BTA for an arrangement? Oh gosh. I can tell you about some materials that weren't used. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun too. <laughs> one, was, um, one was a request from a florist uh, who, who actually did a fabulous displays and he always does um, to use marijuana plants uh, <laughs> for a display. And, you know, it, it, was, a, it was something that, um, that caused everybody to think for a moment because at the time um, marijuana was legal in California, um, but the quantity that this particular florist wanted to use was probably more than would be allowed um, in for any one person's consumption, let alone the thousands who come to BTA. Right. So that was, yeah, <laughs> I think that's probably that probably probably was the most uh, stunning example of a material that didn't make it in. Um, well, you, you saw some examples of some of the other materials, the plexi. Um, and you know the, the use of amazing containers that themselves are almost works of art, um, and, and you know there there are some pretty wild constructions or frames for uh, for certain arrangements that well they defy gravity. Let's put it that way. Wow. All right, um, I just want to tell you, I know you can't see right now, but there are like about 30 comments just saying thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, it was incredible and I definitely echo that. Um, thank you so much, Karen, for joining us. Another successful BBTA. Um, we appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, Tricia, and goodbye, everybody.